Well, I guess I've been selected to get started here. And for those of you who don't know who I am, I'm Ron Gibson. And uh, I want to say what an honor it has been to be here these last four days and the people that I met. Man, you people are super. And uh, I mean that from the bottom of my heart. What a, what a joy to meet all of you. Uh, I want to share a little bit about some knowledge about land. Uh, I want to ask the question, what is land? Any thoughts on what is land? I want you to think about this a minute. Land is the foundation of the world. Water isn't, land is. The land holds the oceans, the streams, all of that, okay? And therefore, that land is critical. Also, your land ownership that each one of you have uh, in your property, that own property, uh, is a God-given right of which to own land. And in through that process, the land and the land laws that have been brought down since the founding of our country have been terribly, terribly abusive to land. And uh, I want to I want to digress just a moment. I do a tremendous amount of research, as the other panelists up here do as well. But I commissioned myself on a journey to find out how much of our public land has been withdrawn. Uh, I read a report, though it's been a year and a half ago now, that we're losing approximately 1,200 acres a day, 365 days a year. That equates to about 430,000 acres uh, in that year. Uh, and over the last 30 years, of which the period that I went back, we've lost over 13 million acres of productive land. Now, I'm not talking about land that is that has been withdrawn, but I want to talk about that for a moment. I did a complete study of all the mineral deposits in the Western United States. And in that, something became very, very apparent that the lands that were withdrawn were very heavily concentrated of valuable minerals. And so I started putting two to two together and started uh, asking questions, and that was done deliberately. And I'm sure all of you are familiar with the term Agenda 21. Uh, when you read that document, on the thing, it's amazing what is being proposed. And let me say it as bluntly as I know how. They're coming after your land. That means you and the little subdivision. That means you that has a big ranch out in the country, or you got five acres, or you got 5,000 acres. The plan is to divest you, number one, of your money, number two, of your rights, and number three, of your property. And if you look at the Communist Manifesto, the 12 blanks, and the very first item on that list is to abolish proper private property. And so we look at one side that is being uh, lost by development or whatever. We look on the other side of the coin. We've got all of this property that is being uh, withdrawn uh, from entry uh, for national uh, parks, uh, for wilderness areas, study areas, uh, game reserve areas, etc., etc. In calculating and doing the research, the lands that have been withdrawn is larger. And I want you to listen to this and just picture in your mind, if you're able, is larger than the entire state of California. In addition, it is larger than Rhode Island, New Hampshire, uh, Vermont, plus another additional 27 million acres. 
That means you can't touch it, you can't do anything with it, it's non-productive, etc. And that makes me ask the question, how much further down the road are they going to go and take away our public land? I don't know how many of you are familiar with the word FLIPMA, Federal Land Policy Management Act, and you folks here with me are certainly abreast to that. That, said, that enactment of Congress was totally unlawful. Congress made the comment that one of the congressmen that they were reclaiming that land. The way I read the Constitution, they never owned it to start with. It's yours and my land. Every land law ever made is under a public land law designation. So what we have now is you have a rogue government that doesn't care about you or your property. You've got these, this huge unjust environmental thing that wants to stop everything so that nobody has anything and put it back to nature. Uh, that's extremely, extremely costly in its own right. And I just want you to know that there's a way in your private property that you own to bring it back to private property, and that's through a land patent. And I did that seminar here yesterday. So we're not going to get into the details of that. If you're interested and weren't here yesterday, get a, get a hold of me. But I also want to say the wealth of information that's been presented here in this conference thing has been phenomenal. I, and I just want us to give these folks a great hand. First of all, I want to say, is there any questions of me before I turn it over uh, to one of the other panelists here? Yeah, I have a question. In the beginning of your conversation, you said the land was moved out. I didn't quite understand where was it moved to or how was there a grasp? I didn't understand what you meant. Again, you said that the land was moved out of the public into or out of the private into the public or under the government. What, what does the that government mean? claimed now ownership of all of the public lands, and then they said that they were going to reclaim it. I want to know where they had right to it to start with. How do you reclaim something that you never had a right to to start with? And so it's created a lot of controversy, and I'm affiliated with a group that's looking at suing the United States government on the base of breach of fiduciary duty about stealing that land, simply because every wilderness, every monument area, whatever, none of those are lawful. So, you know, not that we shouldn't have some things that were are kept pristine, but the whole concept the Wilderness Area Act states on the very first page that there has to be a mineral survey that's done. And if minerals were found there in sufficient quantity for development, then they could not put a wilderness designation on it. They've done the um, uh, Siskiyou uh, monument thing here that just passed about a year, a year and a half ago. And they've tied up the entire, from almost Interstate 5 to the ocean, of this monument issue. There's a lot of private property in that. They're catching hell. And the, any time that there's a mineral reservation or a land withdrawal, they cannot affect private property. But they're doing it everywhere, trying to drive everybody out of your home and your property or your business so that they make this nice little environmental package. And what I'm trying to <clears throat> excuse me, challenge you folks on, you better wake up and take a stand because if you think they're not coming after your property, you're naive as can be because they make no bones about it. I attend meeting after meeting after meeting on this kind of stuff and it's, it's very disturbing what is out there and is going to try to be forced on the American people. They don't want you to own any land. They want to shrink everybody into what they call corridors. And that's right along major highways. So they can control us all like good little boys and girls. Uh, I don't know. I'm a free man. I have no desire to be 
put in that kind of bondage. God made me free, and I have to defend that freedom, and I'm willing to do that to my death, if that's what it takes. So, anyway, I'll turn it over to Anna. Oh, David, he's been quiet all day. Well, he kind of But nobody else spoke but me the first two days. <laughs> so, <clears throat> my voice is a little uh, more out, actually, but... Uh, <clears throat> You listen to me, you listen to Anna, you listen to Ron. We're all telling you the same thing. We're telling it to you in three different ways, but we're all telling you the same thing. Stand up, get off your butts, keep it simple, go out, teach and educate. Do this as quickly as you possibly can. Wake up as many people as you can. I'm going to keep saying that over and over and over again. The more you complicate it, you can be like me. Okay, I spent year after year after year, so did Anna, many years. I've known her at least 20, 25 years, probably. And we spend many, many hours in books and libraries and study, and we've read everything we can get our hands on. And we pull pieces of the puzzle out of a million different locations. And we try and put those pieces of the puzzle together so that we can show it, share it in a simple form so that you don't have to spend four or five hours a day for 30 years in libraries and traveling around and gathering the information and on the internet and whatever it happens to be, thousands of books. You probably don't read as fast as me. And I've read thousands of books. <coughs> Thousands upon thousands of letters and journals of people who lived during the time to all the acts of Congress, the entire United States Code, every state constitution, our federal constitution, almost every treaty. I've read every presidential speech back to Washington. I can go on and on and on and on and on with the things that I've read. Good luck. Trying to keep up. You'll be long dead. And what I'm trying to tell you is this. We don't have that long. We don't have that long. Right now we have a window of opportunity. And it's caused from two very important events. One, President Trump getting elected. Now, people can back talk all you want about that man. But it's not, you can back talk all you want about me and these two up here. It's not about the person. It's not about anything that they do. It's about their results. What did they do against tremendous odds? This man a, was a billionaire. You get that? He gave his businesses over to his kids. He takes no salary. He's being attacked every day a million freaking times. So just, just a mere fact that he gets anything at all done is absolutely amazing. Yet, if you read the executive orders like I have it, so you look at the results of what he's done, it is absolutely amazing. It's not just that. The Ninth Circuit, which has always been one of the most liberal, toughest circuits of our federal court system has now changed. It's very conservative for the number of judges he's put on the bench in the Ninth Circuit. And that's not the only one. This, look at what he's done in the Supreme Court. I was just talking to Ron about a case last year that's so new that he didn't even know about it. And it's a guy that studied land and property rights his whole life. And this case, I could change things for the better for property rights. So he has done a tremendous amount of things. And, uh, you know, I've never really liked brash New Yorkers. I never have. But when I look at the alternatives, 
<laughs> common sense takes over. And common sense takes over. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, it makes you really want to stand. And if you're a Christian, you're religious, you believe in the Bible, you're a spiritual person, you believe in a supreme creator and Mother Earth, and you understand that 2,000 years ago, they wrote a whole bunch of documents on some scrolls, and those predictions have been coming true over and over and over and over again. It's hard to deny. And right now, we're in a 2,000-day window that started in 2017 and ends in 2023. It's called the Great Awakening. And you can tell by this rim. I'll bet you, if we were holding this meeting in 2015, there'd be 15 people in the room. And now there's more than 50. That's because you are waking up. Amen. We're all waking up. Amen. Just the sheer number of cities that I could go to, I would need four or five of me for as many as I turn down compared to the ones I go to. Okay? That means people are waking up all over. And let me tell you something. They ain't just waking up in the United States of America. They're waking up in Canada and New Zealand and Australia and Japan and China and Hong Kong and all over Europe. They're waking up in Africa, South Africa, <laughs> South America. And it's absolutely amazing that starting on that day in September 2017, that you watched all kinds of chaos start to happen. People start to rise up. And it went along like this for a long period of time, and now it's just going like this. And we're just past the 730th day of the 2000 Days of Awakening. What does that mean? What happens at the end of the 2,000 days? Well, first of all, nobody's got a crystal ball. But if you have studied Revelation 12, it tells you that the people rise up and corruption fails. We come out of her, O ye Babylon. We say enough is enough. We're tired of you taking our houses and taking our kids. <laughs> I can't hardly talk without emotion anymore about this because I say it over and over and over again. But we're sick and tired. We're sick and tired of you sending swarms of officers to eat out our substance. To tax those which might not otherwise be taxed. Okay? So get off your butts. Forget about your hobbies. Start bringing children into these groups. Okay? We need 15, 16, 17 year olds into these groups. Grab somebody. If everybody grabbed one person that you know and brought them with you next time, we doubled. Grab four. Grab four. Now's the time. We're in a small window of time, a small window of opportunity. Thank you, Dan. Well, I had questions today, very worthy questions, many people. Um, there's one that came. Uh, we, we need to be aware of how long this has gone on. It's gone on for thousands of years. Not just when you read stuff. In the last 2,000 years, have been the least of it, really. I mean, 
they've come closest to taking over the entire world this time, but on the other hand, this has happened before. At the Council of Nicaea, they just arbitrarily erased 1,100 years of history. They just said, oh, well, you know, that doesn't work for our calendar. Zip, gone. Can you imagine? 1,100 years of history just wiped out by a little group of men. And it, it does kind of go back to David's question. Uh, please explain to me how a little group of men here could write a law and make it apply to me. And how can you erase 1,100 years of human history? But they did it. They just reset the calendars. If you go to the Vatican today, you'll see some very strange things, some very disturbing things as you're walking around Vatican City. But one of the things that you'll see are keyholes. And these keyholes were used as an alignment device to set up the calendars and the, um, the projections of time, which, as I've told you before, doesn't exist. They are set up according to celestial um, parameters in the heavens, and none of them match anymore. The planet has shifted. Things have changed over time, and the keyholes no longer connect to the stars and the constellations as they once did. There are so many things like that that have gone on with weights and measures. What does an ounce mean? What's a foot? What's a second of time? How these things are defined is important. It's far more important than we realize. And so I'm just kind of bringing this forward as an introduction to why can't we just go look this stuff up and why doesn't it make sense when we read it? And it's a process what I call moving the cheese. These people have been burning books and carting off books since the burning of the Great Library in Alexandria. They purposefully keep us dumbed down. There is a reason why my U.S. history was so incredibly boring that I would never rationally ever want to look at a history book again, okay? And there are reasons why these things are obscured and why they're squirreled away. At specific times in history, they bury information. They change the names of things. They renumber and reannotate everything. So often, when we see things, they even change the names of things, or they change the operation of things. So it's confusing. It's deliberately confused so that only those who are in on the scam know what's going on. So don't be so quick to say, oh, I can't find that reference. Or I went to this citation in federal code and it's talking about carrier pigeons. Or to tell me that I don't know what I'm talking about when I tell you to look up the Treaty of Westminster of 18 or 1784. Because these are these are things that are constantly being shuffled around and hidden on purpose. So be aware that they move the cheese, that they don't make it easy, and that they change the definitions. For example, the Congress changed the word, the meaning of the word person. Since the 1860s, the word person, for federal purposes, means corporation. And that's right in the, the um, congressional Federal Register. So all of these things require a lot of effort to find. If you're going to dig, 
you're going to have to dig hard and you're going to have to nail it down. And part of the reason that we have an archive is that we need the hard copies to be able to prove what we're saying. Because if you find it today, you may not be able to find it tomorrow. And if you find it tomorrow, it's going to be renumbered. And if it's renumbered, it's also going to be recataloged. So that's why we have a Patriot Archive. So that we have hard copies of all this stuff. And when they tell us that we're talking through our hat, we can say, well, then explain this to me. Okay? So don't let the masters of deceit stand against what's true. Make the effort, and you'll find that indeed we're not lying to you. If we made a mistake, understand that's an honest mistake. We're not here to lie to you. We're not getting paid to do this. We're not, we have no motive to lie to you, okay? We're giving you the God's honest truth as we know it. And if we don't know it all, we're certainly making a good faith effort to find it all. Anne, how are you doing on your donation for your trip to Vatican City and the Archive Bowl? I don't know because I haven't talked to, to my my treasurer, my my uh, collection. collection people that are you know out there helping out. But one thing is, as our state assemblies grow, there's been more interchange. The state assemblies are supporting us, and then we're supporting the state assemblies, and that's it. You know, because then we we did come up with a lot of the law stuff and a lot of the research stuff to them that they need and uh, we get repaid from the assemblies so it's, it's working out Ron, have, i heard this rumor and you're a mineral man i heard that there there's a well, I, yeah. oh i heard that there's a whole lot of gold in the grand canyon and that's why it's off limits <laughs> you ever heard that <laughs> yeah. Yes. Ron, he, he said he's heard of, there's a whole lot of gold in the Grand Canyons. Is that why it's off limits? Yes. There's also uranium. That was the reason they tied it up to start with. <clears throat> and that it, you'll find every major withdrawn area. And Alaska has been hit up where Anna lives tremendously hard about the withdrawn area. <clears throat> and I want to mention something about that just to take a moment. In the actions that they've done to withdraw these lands, they have stolen your land. I hope you understand this is public land. It is our property. It is we the people. We the people, I don't know if you know the history of the Constitution, but we the people was not originally part of the original drafting of the Constitution. It wasn't until it went to the Commonwealth of Delaware and they said something's missing. They wrote in three words called we the people. What they did, I don't know whether they recognize it or not, made you and I and every person in this great land kings of your land. Okay? I think we need to start acting like it instead of like whip pups because you're a king of your land. That's what the patent does. It gets rid of the, of the warranty deed and gets you back your true title. Because without a true title, you're a slave. And boy, I've talked to some of you people here the last four days. This breaks my heart, the abuse that you have taken. And <clears throat> David mentioned about we want you to stop taxing. You know that the taxing is part of the Communist Manifesto. It's part of the UN to force you out of your home. You may say, well, I can pay my taxes now. What about in five years or 10 years? Because they're gonna keep coming and grabbing unless we stop it. We have, I'm affiliated with another gentleman and I are doing a lawsuit against Yosemite County over this very thing. In your state constitution, there is no provision 
for an ad valorem tax. And that, that violates the intent of Congress. If you go back in the archive records like I've done and Dave has done, it was set up so that the property under a land patent and their lodeal means owing to no one, that no one could come and take the poor man's property, bankers, speculators, and ungodly uh, legislation. But that's what they're doing. And you know why they're doing it? Because we don't stand up. And boy, Anna and Dave have made valid points. You better figure it out, folks, because they're coming. And I cannot overemphasize that enough. And there's just so much that we're behind the eight ball, but it's not beyond our ability to correct it because we are the people. I'm going to interject one thing here to add to what Ron just said. The only fair tax is a tax on what we produce and we sell to others. That's it. Not our wages. That's correct. Not our land. Okay? The sweat of our brow is untaxable. They fooled you. See, Abe Lincoln came up with the 1040 bonds, asking the people for a gift to the government to help pay the debts and costs of the Civil War. And guess what? You still fill out a 1040. All right? What's that? It's voluntary. That's right. Ta taxes are voluntary. We agreed to pay for 19 essential <laughs> governmental services and no more. You think your income tax goes to roads and bridges? No. Your gas tax on something we produce goes to roads and bridges. You're being double taxed. Yeah, you guys, you got to understand a wage and an income are two totally different things. You earn money by the sweat of your brow, that's a wage. Once you've earned that wage and you take it and you go invest it and it makes a little money, that's an income. Why do they call it the income tax and then tax your wage then? See, it's really a capital gains tax is an income tax, not taxes on your wages. All right, so get that through your head. Go ahead. Ron, this question is directed to you. Um, I heard that uh, they're stealing our, can you hear me, Ron? Yes, I can. I hear that they're stealing our ground, and I'm, I'm listening to you, and I comprehend what you're saying. I think many of us need to be educated on how to counterattack these actions, and one of the things we lack is procedure. None of us in here have a problem with knowing how bad the problem is. None of us really have a problem with much of this that you said today's history. Our biggest need is knowing how to go from here today, what we heard, and how to combat them. So I would be very interested in seeing your lawsuit so I may learn from it. That's not a question, that's a statement. So if that be made public for us to learn how to do it, we are all interested, I'm sure. Probably by a show of hands, we're all interested in knowing how to come after us. But here's my question. Here's my question. I've also heard that gas companies that are that are going into the ground and siphoning out our Earth's, our mother's gases, if you would, are taking them in and reselling to selling them to us. I've heard that within a 50 mile radius of these gas companies, every one of those people deserve a kickback on these proceeds. Have you heard that? Is it true? And I've, I've, I've heard some scuttlebutt about, about that. I don't know that I've ever seen any documents or heard anything official on it. But there's a whole lot of other stuff in the peripheral of what you're talking about that has not been considered as far as whether it's lawful or unlawful, if I can put it in that context. But uh, you're right, this lawsuit 
that we file against Yosemite County uh, is going to be very interesting. Here's my fear. Uh, we don't have enough ethical judges. And boy, bless this lady and the ones like her. But there's so few and so far between that if you go to a court now with a lawful and a godly cause, you get run over by the system because judges are in the background getting paid off or they're making a deal or, or the prosecutor or both or whatever the, the, the situation is. And I'm telling you, I've done a lot of study on that stuff, as is Dave, and Anna knows this story better than all of us. But my point of it is that when you go to court, if you don't have an impartial judge, then how do you get a, a, a lawful remedy? Uh, I've seen people that should have won their case hands down, and they don't. And that's one of the things that they're doing to discourage you and I from not going to court on a thing. Just turn them down with the Austin, well, I'm gonna force you to go to the appellate court. I had a case I was sharing with some people here uh, earlier today. I had a case on the thing to where I should have won that hands down and I appealed it. And I sent it to the, their page to have the, my due process with the appeals court. And the appeals court said, we agree with the lower court without opinion. They just destroyed my due process to further it to the Supreme Court, if in fact the Supreme Court would take it. But I'm just saying that's only a grain of sand uh, on the seashore, so to speak. We need godly judges, and our Bible speaks very clearly of what's gonna happen to the ungodly judges. There's four distinct verses in there among other places that woe to you judges, you're unjust to the poor. The wires are not uh, uh, righteousness given to the needy, and on and on and on it goes. And the further away we get from our Bible, the worse things get in our society, and we all get the blunt of that. So uh, I will be more than glad I've got your email and stuff for those of you who are interested in our case. Uh, <laughs> So uh, I'm kind of anxious of what the outcome of that is going to be, too. But it's based upon the fact, so that you know, is that there is no constitutional provision to charge an ad valorem tax on private property. Now, this is one of the, hang on just a second, one of the reasons why I have been pushing so hard on the land patent issue, because now you get your property out of a color of title back to the true title in your name. The patented property, because it's a loyal, is not taxable. That was the intent of Congress. That's been intent of many of the court cases. But when you, the administrative process came in and they converted, stole the patents and reissued a warranty deed, then in essence the problem, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, started because now instead of being private property, it's real estate. Well, what's real estate mean? Belongs to the state, or they claim that it does. So now they can dictate to you what you can and cannot do with your land. They dictate to you setbacks and the color you can paint your house or apartment or whatever the deal is. And and here we are. We're, we're just sitting here paying it every year. They're trying to force you out in many ways, but one of the major one is the increase of taxes. Jennifer was telling me the other day that her taxes, when she did a certain thing and filed a document in the court, the next tax thing she got was increased 103%. That's their retaliation, but there is no constitutional provision of which to tax your private property. Well, then you better get it into private property so you can fight this thing. Because you don't have a snowball chance of hell as long as it's under a warranty deed. Because you don't own the land. So. And in order to own land, you really have to change your status. It all goes to status. Everything in the law 
stems from three things, status, standing, and jurisdiction. And then you have property and rights. Okay, and that's it. You have to change your status, standing, and jurisdiction, know how to stand upon those rights, and enforce your property rights. You can't enforce any right if you don't know your status, standing, and jurisdiction. It's that simple. You don't have any. You have privileges and civil rights. Do you know what civil rights are? <coughs> it just means they can't discriminate against you versus another class of people. That's all civil rights are. Ron, I got a question for Ron. When you say the lands are being withholded, <laughs> is that BLM? Is that what you're talking about? Oh, no, I'd say again. The, the lands that are being withholding, you said they're withholding the lands. Is that BLM? Is that what you're talking about? Withholding the lands? Are you talking about the public lands? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, it, it's not only BLM land, it's any government held land other than military bases, uh, ammunition stock, uh, storage facilities, ports, dogs, ports. Yeah, you know, post office and all of that. But, but, but again, folks, remember that land was not voted on by the people. They stole your land from you, the people, or we, the people. So it's not BLM land, and I jump all over people when they call it BLM land, and they call it Forest Service land, and they call it government land. The first thing I want to do is I want to see your title. The Wayne Hay case in Nevada, they won that case on the basis that government could not provide a title. And without a title to land, you can't claim the land. That's why the land patent issue is so important. Because when you transfer that from point A to point B, buyer to seller, seller to buyer, whatever, on the, you have a title. The warranty deed is not a title. So I hope that answers your question. Yes. I'm going to wow his alley for everybody. <laughs> United States citizens and citizens of the United States cannot own land. Yeah. That's another big important reason for those of you who have land to change your status as well as bringing your patent forward. Oh, amen. Amen. In statute, they actually say all property shall be vested in the state for the United States citizen. What's that tell you? See, anything other than a land patent passed down through a grant deed <coughs> is an abstract of title. A warranty. What did I talk about on the board with warrant? When I talk about a warrant, they're waging war. They're declaring war. Warranty is a warrant tie. Do you understand that? What do you mean? They tie it up in a waging of war. You have to understand language. For our lack of knowledge, we're destroyed. Okay? Anything that says Break down words. Okay? A warranty is a warrant. It's a declaration of war. You get a warrant on your car, a warranty for your car, it's actually a de declaration of war. Okay? All right. I got a question. Anna had said once that the Western states aren't developed or they is there a land patent um, missing in big areas? Like they're, they're, you say that they're taking this public land back. Was there ever a land patent on it? There's a land patent, but the thing is, is that what happens is that the territorial government is supposed to cede its jurisdiction to the state when the state is formed. And all of the property, all the land within that border is supposed to be handed over, right? And that is supposed to go to the people. It's supposed to be our, our land, our public land, and our private land. 
Instead, what happens is that it goes into a trust, and the trust is managed in a, in a custodial or proprietorship capacity by the entities like BLM, or the Forest Service, or the Park Service, okay? So they're just custodians. They're not owners. They're not possessors of the land, okay? So in the Western states, that transfer into the custody of the state and of the people has not occurred because, guess what? There has not been a land jurisdiction county, um, what am I saying, a land jurisdiction congress since 1860. So this means that we have to get busy, we have to establish our proper status, we have to establish our actual land jurisdiction states, we have to um, bring our land patents forward, we have to um, then convene our land jurisdiction, our Continental Congress, okay, and with our Continental Congress, we have to accept the statehood compact that we have as a federation of states with all of the Western states that were formed after the Civil War. So this is very important. We have to finish the reconstruction. And every time somebody that knows what they're talking about says, we haven't had that since 1860, I want you to repeat after me. Thank you, Honest Abe. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Right. What was the Supreme Court case, the land case last year? I've given it to Ron. I can't remember the names. That's why I asked. <laughs> <laughs> last year, there's only one. <clears throat> Of course, I have said that, but so I don't know. But he's got it. I said it to him. Is it Nick versus get it Township? To there you go. Yeah. Yes. Nick versus Township of Scott, Pennsylvania, et al. certiori to the United States Court. Okay. It was over a cemetery. <laughs> All right. Next question. So we move this thing along. Sir. Is there online questions, Rob? Uh, I do have one uh, that's been persistent. <laughs> <laughs> so you've been ignoring the others? <laughs> um, it says, uh, how can a living man, John, all lowercase letters, buy a car, a house, etc., from a corporation and have the title transferred to John, all lowercase letters? Doesn't John need a legal fiction, like a capital letter John, in order to complete the transaction and hold the title in the John Trust? Does commerce even see or recognize lowercase John? Okay. Congress doesn't need to see or recognize lowercase John. Amen. You can hold that anywhere. You can hold it in private. You can hold it in trust. Congress doesn't need to recognize the Lord case John. All they have to know is that we declare our own status. That's it. And they say it very simply. It's not up to us. They tell you this. It's not up to us. You have the inalienable right of self-determination. It's up to you. Here's our definition of statuses. You pick one. We don't care which one you pick. We'll, we accept any of these, it said. You pick one. You tell us who you are. Notify us. Notify us in writing under the penalty of perjury. So if you have to show up in court, we can hold you to it. And let us know what it is. And that's why we declare our status with an affidavit to the Secretary of State just to put them on notice of what we choose. The U.S. Code does not apply to me, the man. 
it applies to them, the public servants. If we are going to interact with our public servants, the United States Code was put there to tell us how to interact and how to hold them accountable. That's the only reason it's there, is for us to use to hold our public servants accountable. Get that through your head. More patriot groups on earth and more people who try and jump into common law jurisdiction with both feet when they have dominion over all three. They can walk amongst them if they want. But they try and jump from one into the other with both feet. They don't understand how to interact back and forth with the different jurisdictions. And those laws aren't for us. State statutes are not for the man. State statutes are for the state employees. By making you a citizen of a state, which is an American state national who runs for office as a public servant, now you're an employee. You're serving the other state nationals. That makes you a state citizen. And you can jump back and forth every time you go home and take off your uniform. So what I told Miss Hayward, when she puts her T-shirt on in the morning that's got her badge on it, she becomes a public servant and she is a state citizen. When she goes home and she takes her shirt off and she puts on her clothes to do whatever it is she wants to do, she becomes a state national, a sovereign, she's double sovereign. She's a sovereign American and she's a sovereign American Indian. Okay? She holds two wonderful positions. So this is what we've got to understand. The single most important step is to know who you are. This young man over here against the wall asked me today at lunch. He came from Mexico. He's lived in this country for many, many, many years. He's had a green card. He's legal in this country. But he doesn't want to be a U.S. citizen. Smart man. Amen. Okay. So how does he become naturalized? He's lived here more than seven years. In common law, it's seven years. If I'm if I meet a woman I like and we get along and we can make it seven years, we're common law married. It's that simple. If you inhabit land you call your own for seven years, you do an affidavit and notify your secretary of state in the state that you have chose to inhabit because it's his own independent nation that you have declared you are this person this man and you have occupied this land for more than seven years therefore you're a texan Understand that? And once that Secretary of State certifies that, well, that document, and he can ask for it to be certified, guess what? He can throw his green card out the window. Okay? One last thing that I'd like to let you folks know that it's a matter of, of information. We don't live in sovereign states anymore. The states became corporations and therefore relinquished that designation and jurisdiction of a sovereign state. You're sovereign, but the state is not. I'm going to correct that just a little bit. Mm -hmm. The state is only not sovereign when you're a person and you're dead. When you're a person, you're a dead entity a vessel, a transmitting utility. When you're a man and you are living, you're not residing in the state, you're inhabiting the state, you're domiciled there. See, the term resident is someone there temporarily to do business. By the sheer use of your zip code, you're in, you live in Washington, D.C. 
There's 327 million people in this country who live in Washington, D.C. They just <laughs> reside in whatever state they're in temporarily to do business. And that's the way it's treated in the law. I, I got a question for you. I, I see one of your videos and you, you said that you dissolve like county corporations. Okay, if there's somebody providing like a water service, you know, city water and stuff like that. What do you do with that? Because it had been part of the corporation. You set up a, a private company to provide water, or how do you do that? Corporations could be corporations could be created and they could be dissolved. Right. If you have an incorporated county and we the people all get together and say, hey, let's take a vote. And we don't want to live in an incorporated county anymore. Right. Then we pull its corporate charter and we dissolve it. Right, right. And it's done. Now we live in an unincorporated area. So there's a lot of unincorporated cities in the United States. And there's a, at least, almost in every state, there's at least a, one incorporate, unincorporated county. You can't talk. Anyway, we could dissolve a corporate state of. The state, a court case that I just ran out and signed notarized documents on. Oh my gosh. The state of New York, you know, is, is at 444 North Congress, Northwest Congress Avenue in Washington, D.C. That's where it's located. No, oh, Capitol Boulevard. Sorry, I got it wrong. So, Capitol Boulevard, it doesn't matter. The point is, it's in Washington, D.C. That's where the state of New York is located. All right? So is every other. Incorporated state. They're incorporated in DC. Now here's a here's a fun one for you. All right. The people of the state of New York versus Fred Benz. He asked for a trial by jury. Where are they going to get the jury? You can't be the plaintiff and the jury at the same time. Mm -hmm. So therefore, he can't have a trial by jury. No due process of law. Case should be dismissed. So what did they do when I pointed that out to them? Oh, it's New York versus Fred Benz now on all their paperwork. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. You just changed entities on who's suing the man? Yeah, that's how creative they are. I should say stupid they are. But, you know, these are well-educated bar association members who have got a doctorate degree in the law. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> what, 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 yeah. I was, what I was asking is, okay, you dissolve the county, but let's just say it's a city, like this corporation was a city, but like your water service would be like another corporation, but it's still like a, a, a child of the major corporation. How do you? Mine, uh, just about all of them are not. Okay. Very quickly, I'm going to answer this in a, a way I hope you understand. Okay. The United States government has a Dun Bradstreet number and a Manta.com report is a private for profit entity. The state of Texas, not Texas, right. the state of Texas. Yeah. Is a private for profit corporation with a Dun & Bradstreet number and a Manta.com report is a private for profit entity. The county of whatever county this is in is a private for profit business. The city of Austin is a private for profit business. The city of Austin Police Department is a private for profit business. The Child Protective Services Agency is a private for profit business. The courthouse in the state of New York, I proved that the first district court of Cache County, Utah, is owned by one man whose corporate headquarters is in Ogden, not even in the same county, and his corporate headquarters has an address. And then we found out he owns seven county courthouses in the state of Utah, just like you would McDonald's franchises. One man. Now, is that a de jure government? Okay, seriously. Know your enemy. Whoever is coming after you in any way, shape, or form, do a background research report.
find out which corporation it is, show that they're de facto, that they're operating without fact, that they're just merely actors, and why do you have to obey, obey a corporation? <clears throat> If McDonald's came after you, or Walmart, or Fred Meyer, or whoever else you got around here, you know, can they kick your door down and steal your kids? Or at the hospital, steal your kids? No, what would you do with them if they showed up in a Walmart uniform? Walmart shirt on, the old blue ones, and said, hey, I'm here to take your kids. Yeah, I know what i do with them. Okay? They're no different. Since governments have chosen to incorporate themselves, they must follow the same rules as any other corporation. That's a Supreme Court case. That they are no longer de jure, they are de facto. That's a Supreme Court case. The rules, codes, statutes, and ordinances are not law. That's the corporate bylaws. That's a Supreme Court case. Do you understand when I add all these cases up what it really says? They have no authority that you do not give them. Governments operate through the consent of the government. I can go on and on and on and on. You give them the authority. That's the only reason I jumped in and corrected Ron, is because you have to be alive and be a man and be a de jure to own property. When, like Anna just said, if you are a citizen, you're dead. Okay. See, the word standing, I keep saying status, standing in jurisdiction, but we almost always jump over standing. What is standing? You ever driven down the road and seen a dead deer on the side of the road? Did he ever get up and walk away? He has no standing. So therefore, the statement, all persons are equal in the law, rich or poor, or black or white, it doesn't matter, you're all equal, is because all persons are dead. So when I, a living man, walk into a courtroom, I'm the only one with standing. <laughs> I just wanted to share one thing quickly, Anna, and that is uh, I want to encourage you all to read a very famous case called City of Dallas versus Mitchell. You didn't read that. And I'm not going to tell you the punchline because you're going to love it. <laughs> you know, I'm a mom. I'm not only a mom, I'm a grandma. And on top of that, I'm a great grandmother. Okay? So there are certain things that really, really hit a nerve with me. I mean, like a, a tooth nerve, something that just absolutely sends me ballistic. And it's the theft of our children. And this began in 1921 with the Shepherd Counter Maternity Act, which created the registration of children. It was so unpopular it was repealed, but then they just split it up and managed to backdoor it, just like they did the um, incorporation of the municipal corporation. I want to point out to you that the states of states tell us that this makes us a United States citizen, this registration that takes place at the hospital. But that doesn't apply to us. That does not give them the option of, of getting access to our full faith and credit under the U.S. Constitution, Article 4, Section 1. It's invalid because it assumes power not granted to Congress and asserts local police power. And here are just a few of the U.S. Supreme Court cases that prove it. McCullough versus Maryland, United States versus Cruikshank, Hammer versus Dagenhart, the child labor tax cases, Hill versus Wallace, the list goes on. Congress cannot assume and state legislatures cannot yield the powers reserved to the states. Now, listen, states, not states of states. States of states are just businesses in the business of providing governmental services. 
But Congress cannot assume, and state legislatures cannot yield the powers reserved to the states by the Constitution. You should read the message by President Monroe, May 4, 1822. There are a lot of state uh, Supreme Court cases about that, too. There's Pollard's um, Lisi versus Hagen. There's Escanaba versus Chicago, Coyle versus Oklahoma, Cincinnati versus Louisville and Nashville Railroad Company. A statute attempting by imposing conditions upon a general privilege to exalt, to exact a waiver of constitutional right is null and void. Okay, think about that. A statute, as in state statute, attempting by imposing conditions upon general privilege, such as your right to travel, to exact a waiver of constitutional right, your right to travel being exchanged for a driver license, is null and void. Harrison versus St. Louis and San Francisco Railroad Company Terrell, T-E-R-R-A-L, versus Burke Construction Company. And finally, and I want to really drive this one home, is that cooperative government is not provided for by the Constitution. All of these councils of state governments and councils of county governments that you're seeing pop up everywhere, those are UN operations. They don't have a darn thing to do with us. And if our corporate county governments, these businesses that are just merely providing us with government services, join these groups, they're acting in contravention of our constitutional rights. So, it's all a bunch of bourgeois. <laughs> let's, let's just cut it down to the pure and simple. This is fraud and usurpation. It's illegal, it's unlaw unlawful, immoral, and it all begins with stealing our children, with misidentifying us as them, them substituting their rules, their government, their entire bailiwick, and imposing it on us secretively. This has been kept from you for a reason. It's been kept from you for the express purpose of fleecing you, robbing you, oppressing you, subjecting you, and making you miserable. Okay? And we're third parties to their civil war. We're innocent third parties who are not involved in whatever credola that they have going on between themselves. This is like my, my property management company goes to war with my lawnmower uh, company, okay? This is crazy. We're caught in the middle of a mercenary war on our soil, and we're being mistaken as combatants. And the way that they're drawing, into, drawing us into the middle of this mess is by misidentifying us at the hospital. <coughs> when we're born, and not telling us, which is an entirely unconscionable contracting process. So, why are they suddenly having a hard time providing us with our quote-unquote birth certificates, which are actually our death certificates? Because it's evidence of crime, people. Those birth certificates prove unconscionable contracting. They prove that our estates were illegally, immorally, and unlawfully probated without our knowledge or consent. And if you go through the process and have a birth certificate authenticated for use outside the United States in a non-Hague country, it will come back and it will show that you have been bonded, and specifically what the bond number is, okay? And it will also show you that they have access to your full faith and credit without your knowledge or consent. That too is evidence of crime 
against you. So realize what these documents are and the power that they have. Understand why when you walk into a court and you lay them down on the table, the lawyer next to you is going to go, oh no. Because those documents prove that they have committed crime against you. And that's why they're important to secure and to have. And to secure and have those documents as they relate to any of your children. Because when you go back to the hospital where your child was born, I will guarantee you that if you aren't there within 30 days of giving birth, those records are gone. You were never there. You didn't give birth. And if you did, you certainly didn't walk out of the hospital with a living baby. Now, if that doesn't make your blood run cold and hot at the same time, if you don't want to get up as a mother and just go over to the local hospital and start pasting hospital administrators until they're black and blue, I don't know what would make you feel angry. I myself had the terrible experience of having given birth prematurely under very hard circumstance, being very sick, being very drugged, and having Two women, two dried up nasty women who look like they must have served on the Democratic National Committee. <laughs> so they come in my room and they have their paperwork, right? And behind them, in the doorway, is a male nurse. A great big male nurse. Like 6'5", 300 pounds, tattoos up to his shirt uh, sleeves. And they tell me that I have, to, I have to sign this document, and that if I don't sign this document, they're keeping my baby. We're not talking about anything subtle here. We're talking about upfront racketeering and coercion under supreme duress being practiced against mothers in hospitals. This has to stop. And this is their primary means of what they call um, latching onto, right? The dead baby scam, this is where it begins. Latching on to our living flesh, misrepresenting the entire situation, and securing a salvage right on the quote unquote dead baby. There is no record of you being born at a hospital because, according to the false records they've been keeping, you died. That's what created the infant decedent estate that they are administering under dead letters of administration. And I can show you the paperwork that the circuit court uses to both improperly probate your estate and improperly administer your state. Estate, I should say. So, this is all a scam, it's all criminal, it's all fraud, and they've been getting away with it for years. All of this needs to come to a screeching halt, and we all need to contact the circuit court in the counties where we were born and tell them straight up, we know what's going on, we want their record corrected, we're not dead. Hello. I got the right. So, right, right before you ask yours, I see Daniel's frustration and him pacing back and forth along the room. So I'm going to answer his question that none of the three of us answered. It's page 114 in the land patent book. It 
is the instructions on exactly the process to follow to put your land in land patent, followed by all of Ron's documents are in there of exactly what the document should look like. So the entire process is right in the middle of that book. Thank you. question for Anna or either of you, but for some states that uh, will no longer authenticate um, birth certificates for countries outside of the Hague, um, is there any recommendation or suggestion for what people should do in those circumstances? I just cut to the chase, go straight to the U.S. State Department, make my um, repudiation of territorial and municipal citizenship, and Give them their marching orders. Thank you. Can, can, I, can I just uh, give you a little different thing? Because a lot of things just got said that uh, sort of make me mad. And I, I'd rather, I'm at a point where I'd rather you know, get even than get mad. I'm here to miss you off. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the other day, you said something that I think. That struck me home, and I'm not sure what they're standing on. Nobody enemy. Repeated. And, and you need to know your enemy. And in this case, what I'm concerned about is a lot of the things we talk about are administrative. It's done by people that, frankly, they didn't do it, they didn't make it, they're just doing it. And, 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 that. and when I think about that, and I think about who's the enemy, it's not them. It's so oh, yes. And I, I try to think about whose hand I want to, you know, which right 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 right. you know. But I thought of 51 people that are actually very interesting to think about. And what I'm going to ask you now is can you give me an example of any of the 50 governors or the president of the United States who, by executive order, and they all have the power to do that, have told somebody to stop screwing around with us. And so, they'll do it in nice language, but I mean- Yeah, yeah. President Trump. Yeah. As okay. executive order, after executive order, okay. after executive order, he has solved a tremendous number of issues for us. Can, can we get that list somewhere and publish it? Well, so that we can it's called Google. <laughs> okay. Okay. Google Trump I'd executive have, orders. I'd rather have more breaking though. And there are dozens, okay, dozens. He made child sex trafficking an international crime. He asked for we the people's help in to fight corruption in our judicial system and our executive branch. He has gone on and on and on to do things to help we the people get back. He's restored the Republic of the United States of America through executive order. He brought me to tears when he told me that. So let me tell you something. <laughs> he did more in the first three months than our last president did in eight years. And, and against governor, all odds. Are there any governors in of the 50 of them? Are there, is there anyone? Not in the state I live in. I can tell you that. Yes, yes. I can tell you state legislatures are stepping up to the plate. The state of, I'll just run for a couple of examples. The state of Idaho has thrown all their regulatory manuals out the window. And they are bringing back regulations one at a time that make sense that comply to their constitution of the state of Idaho. The state of Alabama listened to my classes. And, and the 10th Amendment Society stood up and they went to their state legislature and they said, no state marriage licenses. We get married in the Bible, that it gets handed to a probate judge, the probate judge properly records it, and then you're married the way it should be, with God as the third party, not the state as the third party. Okay, on and on and on. We got the entire Supreme Court of West Virginia off the bench. 
hundreds, <laughs> hundreds of judges we've taken off the bench this year alone. Almost every week, two or three prosecutors, they're being told to knock it off. We've picked up more, the Department of Justice picked up over 1,700 pedophiles. The Department of Defense has picked up more than 3,800 pedophiles. Okay. Many, many things because President Trump made child child trafficking an international crime instead of a U.S. crime, giving the Department of Defense the authority to try them under the UCMJ. Yes. I, I have a question on the dead baby scam. Um, say you uh, get elected a uh, county sheriff, and parents said they don't want to get called, they don't want their baby getting a, a birth certificate. Because I've seen videos of this happening. Okay. Can they, what do you do? Um, because what if both parents are still U.S. citizens or, or, or corporate, incorporated entity? What, what do you do in that circumstance? Change their citizenship. The parents. The parents must change their citizenship. To, to claim the baby. Under international law, I don't care what country you live in, they're required to have a birth certificate under international law. In all Commonwealth of England countries, including the United States and Canada and New Zealand and Australia and on and on and on and on and on. Now, in saying that, I know an entire family that has 10 children that are all grown up and having their own kids, and not one of them's ever had a birth certificate, not one of them's ever had a had a driver's license, not one of them has ever had a social security number. They've lived just fine. They live dandy. They start their own trading company. They all work for the company, the entire family. It's a going business. They make good money. They live as good as any of us, and they've never done any of that. But, but I've seen a video where a guy, they would not allow them to take their child home. That's because a slave cannot dictate to its master. Right. I didn't know that. That's what I was asking because I didn't know where. Because it seemed to me that he was was claiming himself as a sovereign. Unless you've done the right paperwork, you have to do it all. And, and then you're just had and they act allow, and so and they they're not forced to tell the slave that he hadn't filled everything out. He has to know it by your research. Legal operates off presumption, assumption, and tacit agreement right, right. and hearsay. That's it. No fact or truth shall be tried in court. Right. Here's the problem, folks. As long as you're misidentified as a U.S. citizen of either kind, territorial or municipal, you have no right. You're a slave, period. Either you're an indentured servant or you're a slave. Those are your choices and you're still under the subjection of a foreign government. That foreign government requires their citizens to register the birth of all their children, okay? Those are foreign governments that are requiring this, and they are getting away with this because they've misidentified us. They're claiming that we are their citizens instead of being Americans, okay? So that's how they're getting away with it. The problem begins with us not claiming our proper status, all right? And then it is promulgated upon our children. That's how these evils and horrors are happening. So, I have a question. Um, I did the best that I could to get a declaration of status to be a non-U.S. citizen. Um, I, no, I notified eight, 18 city, state, and, and national agencies. Uh, I also um, appointed uh, the president and the secretary of treasury as trustees for 
the all caps estate birth certificate, which was uh, double authenticated by the state and uh, federal secretaries of state. Uh, so I did it the best that I could. Uh, and um, I have this case going on in Louisiana in commerce, operating in commerce, right? The kind of court that we don't want to be in, right? And I like the analogy of the Walmart where you have the uh, Walmart knocking on your door. Well, what if Walmart's saying you can't have your property? Uh, you're going to laugh them you know, right out of your face. But what if they tried to impose that on you and you said corporate bylaws? You understand your state Supreme Court can operate right. in multiple jurisdictions. Right. All that judge has got to do is know which words you're using and then his hat gets turned. Right. And now he's operating in a different jurisdiction. But right. when you misuse your words and you say, like you just said, out of your own mouth, I'm operating in commerce. It's, no, you're talking about a land issue. Right. A land and a minerals issue. That is not in commerce. Because I've been trapped in commerce. You've been trapped in commerce. Right. That's right. So you right. can't properly administer the land. Correct. So it's sort of a commingling, if you will. Maybe. That's right. Right. And the minute you commingle, that's why they administer. Right. Right. And so. Going down this nine-year rabbit trail of co-mingling and, <laughs> and the story that Ron, uh, the comment that Ron Gibson made just uh, maybe half an hour ago about starting at the county and then getting pushed to the appellate court and then to the state Supreme Court, just getting the door slammed in his face, denied his uh, 14th Amendment right to due process of law. Uh, you know, I'm at the point, I'm almost done by the way with my question. I'm at a rich certiori point. And I've got, now this is the, the, the statistic, over 5,000 writs get submitted every year and only 200 to 300 of them get heard. That's just beyond ridiculous. Uh, I have- 5%. 5% five, five chance. Now, just any, uh, any recommendations as to anyone I can get in touch with, uh, uh, a higher court uh, to try to get out of that statistic. Uh, and I, I direct that question to all of you. Yeah. Um, what would you do? Uh, you have the environmental court. You got the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. You've got many, many, many other options besides what, the, what you're doing. A different approach you have. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Could you uh, cite Title Eight, the, the sections and things again for the repudiation? Can Section Eleven Hundred One of Title Eight of the United States Code is your definitions of status. They list a whole bunch of them. Title 8, 1101, Section A21 is a state national. It's the only one with limited diplomatic immunity. A22, you'll notice, is a state citizen, and on and on and on. You can be a U.S. citizen, a U.S. national, a state citizen, a state national, and many other statuses. But there's only one that makes you a real people. That gives you limited diplomatic immunity as per the Geneva Conventions. Only one. And it's Title 8, 1101, A21. That's it. A is Apple 21? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? If not, we'll be closing. Right. The doors. We're locked. God bless you all. Hey, you guys. Hey, you guys, I think we're uh, we're making history here. And how about we get some photographs with all you guys? How about that? that that's fine. I'm going to say one quick thing. I've been getting emails as I've been sitting here. And a guy I really love a lot. He's 82 years old. He served this country. And you're all sitting here because he did something. Or you wouldn't be here if he hadn't done it. So he told me 
Unsuccessful people measure success with money, titles, and position. Successful people measure success with how much difference they make in other people's lives.